Happy New Year. Great to see so many, of here that you, so many of you guys here this morning. I thought you guys would be all partying and not be able to make it. Should have planned for success. Anyways, great to see you this morning. Uh, great to be in a new year with you. Um, thank you to the praise team for that song set, especially that last song. Um, that last song is just a prayer. Every time we start a new sermon series, um, it's a song that we want to sing as a prayer. I, I believe that song has so much of what God wants to do in our lives as we come to His Word and as we, uh, His Word is preached. So that is a song that um, we want to sing as a prayer to God every time we start a new sermon series. And we're just asking God to, to work and move in our lives. We're starting a new sermon series this week. Um, We'll be going through that until Easter time. It's called Restart. And it's, it's about a series of what does it mean to restart, in our, to have a restart in our lives. I believe many of us, we are needing a, a, a redo. We've been going in circles and we need a redo. What does that look like? Where do we find that in Scripture? So that's what this series is all about. Um, I'll get more into that in a second, but I think first we just need to pray. Let's ask for God's help. Lord, it's the first day of the year, and already I know that the enemy wants to steal from us. That the enemy comes as a thief to steal, kill, and destroy. Thank you that you are our good shepherd. Lord, we've come here this morning because you are in, have invited us as your sheep that you will be the good shepherd over us. That as we sang this morning, that our lives can be bound to yours and experience the good life, experience goodness, life to the full, life abundant. So God, thank you for your invitation. Lord, we pray that this year will not just be like every other year that has passed. But God, we are asking for a movement and a work of your spirit in our congregation. We're asking for new obedience. We're asking for a new experience of your presence. Lord, we want new relationship with you, Lord, this, this year. And so, Lord, we come to you who can lead us into that newness or into that restart. We come to you believing that it's in you that we find it. So, Lord, we thank you that we've gathered, gathered here this morning to start this year with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When God rescued uh, and brought Israel out of Egypt and out of slavery and oppression and death, it was to bring them into a land God would give them to start a new life. And the, this land was something that God first promised to Abraham, and that's why it's called the promised land. In Numbers 13, 27, Deuteronomy 6.3 and Deuteronomy 11.9, we're told that this land is a land flowing with milk and honey. You know, it was a fertile land. It was a rich and desirable land. It was a land that would produce abundant food. The promised land was not only a, an abundant land flowing with milk and honey. It was a, a land where there would be a blessing of rest. And once again, we find this kind of defined for us in the book of Deuteronomy 12, 9 to 10, where it tells us the rest was rest from oppression, rest from assault from enemies. Deuteronomy 12, 1 tells us not only was it a place of rest and abundance, but it was also a place for certain ways of living that would reflect who God is and reflected the good life. And finally, the promised land was where God will fulfill his promises to Abraham that the descendants of Abraham, who was Israel, would be a blessing to the whole world, would be a light to the whole world. As they're experiencing God, as they're living with God, 
They would be, they were supposed to be a light to the rest of the world of how good God is, how great God is. But what should have been an 11-day journey from Egypt to the promised land of Canaan turned out into 40 years of wandering in circles in the wilderness. For 40 years, they lived in poverty, facing a shortage of food and water. They were living in tents instead of houses. They were constantly fighting wars, facing one disease or difficulty after another. So it's no wonder that Israel, we hear Israel saying over and over again when we, hear, when we read the first five books of the Bible, right, especially Genesis, Numbers, Deuteronomy, what do we hear Israel saying over and over again when they come toward difficulty? Let's pick a leader and let's go back to Egypt. This, is, this poverty is so difficult. It was actually better in Egypt as slaves. Let's go back to Egypt. That was their default attitude. Let's go back to Egypt. This is, this is too difficult. See, instead of moving forward, moving forward with God into the promised land, remember that they, they were given an opportunity. God said, go into the promised land. I'm going to give it to you. They refused. They refused to go in. And basically they thought, our, our two options, there's two options. One, we're going to die in poverty in the wilderness. Or two, we go back to Egypt as slaves and we die. I saw a story online um, about a woman in Oregon who needed help in the worst way and actually died homeless. But what is unique about her story is that she died in a warming center in the middle of winter not knowing that she had an inheritance of $884,447. It was left to her by her mother. She, she had great need. And she died not knowing that she had this kind of an inheritance. And maybe for us, maybe for the last few years, that's the way that we've been living. We've been going in circles our life has been going in circles in a wilderness, not knowing that there is an inheritance for us, that we, didn't, we don't have to live like that. That's not our, that's not our only option. We, didn't, we don't know that we have an inheritance. God has an inheritance for us, that we don't have to live in spiritual poverty. Some of us, maybe we've, we've come out of Egypt. We've been saved. We're a Christian and that's been our experience. Like we thought we would be in the promised land, but what we're experiencing these days is just we're in wilderness. And to be more specific, maybe some of us this morning, it's, it's an area of our lives where we've been walking in circles. We've been walking in circles in the wilderness, and it's keeping us from enjoying God's inheritance. And for some of us, for others of us, or maybe a lot of us here, if we can just be brutally honest this morning, we've become Christians. We came out of Egypt, we were saved, we became Christian. But today, what is the truth about our lives is that we're in a wilderness where we're utterly bored and disinterested in God. That's just the truth of the matter. And the good news of God's word and the good news and encouragement of this sermon series is that we don't have to continue walking aimlessly in a wilderness, not knowing that God has an inheritance for us this year. That's the good news, that there is a promised land for us this year. This series, it's not about New Year's resolutions and, and new habits that sometimes work and many times they don't. Many times by the time uh, end of February rolls around, those, those new resolutions are gone, those new habits are gone. This isn't a series about that. This isn't a series about novel techniques that we just want something novel, something new. Novel techniques that are promising us that it will revolutionize our lives. This is, this is not a sermon series about that. This is not a sermon series about name it and claim it and, and get whatever you want. Whatever you want, just name it and claim it and it's yours. It's, uh, this series is actually opposite of that. It's God may ask you to give something up so that you can receive God's inheritance for you. He may ask you, there's something that you need to leave in the wilderness. There's sin that you need to leave in the wilderness. 
There's things that is breaking your relationship with God that you need to leave in the wilderness that is hindering you to receive God's inheritance. It's not about name it and claim it. And it's also not about a series where we're forcing God's hand to move in our lives, that we've somehow found a loophole in God's word, and we're saying, God, see, I got you, God, I got you. Now you have to do what I want you to do. It's not that. We don't have to do that. This series is not about that. It's God has already said to us, there's an inheritance. I want you to have it. I'm giving it to you, right? We don't have to look for some loophole where we're saying, God, I got you. I, I, I can force your hand to work. God's saying, I have an inheritance for you. Just step into it in faith. God's saying, this is available for you today. I want you to have it. That's what this series is all about. It's just stepping into what God has already provided for us, saying he's already given to us if we will just step in. So as we go through the book of Joshua, or at least the first seven chapters of Joshua, together we just, we're learning. What is it, how is it that God led Israel from wilderness into the promised land? And what does that speak to our lives today? How do we now go from going in circles in the wilderness to now walking into God's inheritance, walking into the promised land, stepping into what God says is yours, I've given it to you, it's available now. Receive it. And then ultimately, for us to be a light to the world, to have a testimony and be a witness to the goodness of God. The book of Joshua, it begins with God getting Joshua and uh, Israel ready to finally enter the promised land. That's where the book of Joshua begins. The first words of the book of Joshua are that is, is to tell us that Moses is dead. And God's first words to Joshua are also the death of Moses. And it's not exactly the kind of pep talk that we expect here. Like, Joshua is about to lead Israel into the fight of their lives in the promised land in Canaan. And this is not the kind of talk that we kind of expect. It doesn't seem like the right talk for going and fighting the battle of your life, and God is talking about a funeral. It looks odd, like it, it looks odd on the surface, but this preparation of Joshua is actually something that God needed to resolve, and there's a great word of encouragement for us here. And there was a great word of encouragement for Joshua as well. You know, the end of Deuteronomy tells us there was no prophet like Moses who the Lord knew face to face, who God said was called his friend, whom, through whom God revealed his mighty power, right, did wonders. Joshua didn't meet God face to face. When Moses went into the tent of meeting to meet with God face to face, we read in Exodus 33, 11, Joshua stood outside the tent of meeting and he wouldn't depart. Joshua wanted to know God that way. He wanted that kind of intimate meeting with God that way. But he couldn't go in. He was outside the tent of meeting just, just hoping to get close to God the way that Moses did. It wasn't Moses. Joshua was not Moses. When God would do a mighty act to give Israel victory in a battle, Joshua was given the practical task like, pick men, lead the battle, right? The miracle would be done through Moses. Do you remember that? Do you remember the story in the Bible where Moses has to, when he lifts up the staff, they, they're winning the battle, but when the staff lowers, they're losing. Joshua was, Joshua was the one leading the battle. He was, he was commanded to go and lead the battle while Moses performed the miracle. Joshua was not Moses. And th there's this as well, and this is the kicker. When Israel formed the golden calf, 
while Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments. The people came within the inch of their lives. God was going to get rid of all of the Israelites, and he said he was going to start over with Moses and his family. They, the people came within an inch of their life. What saved them? What saved them? It was Moses standing in the gap. It was Moses and his fellowship with God. It was Moses and his covenant fellowship with God that stood in between God's wrath and the people. It was Moses' intercession that saved the people from God's wrath and changed God's mind and spared the people. So, like, here is Moses, this great leader who, who's been led by God like no other leader, who, through whom all the mighty acts were done, the wonders and miracles. And up ahead, what is up ahead? For Joshua and Israel, the raging Jordan River. They have to cross that raging Jordan River. You know, my uncle went to the Holy Land and he said that they were following the path that they believe Israel took crossing the Jordan River. And he said that as he was going um, through the raging Jordan River, he said there was, a, there was even a point, how, how treacherous the waters are, there was a point where he felt like if he took another step, the waters were just going to sweep him away. They have to cross that water. They got to do it this time without Moses. You, you guys see how, how distressful this situation was, that they've lost their leader? They lost someone who, was, who had such a unique and special relationship with God. And it couldn't have been louder to Joshua, and it couldn't have been louder to Israel, that Joshua, you're not, you're not Moses. But after God tells Joshua that Moses is dead, he doesn't say, hey, Joshua, uh, you, better, you better figure out what you're going to do as a leader because uh, hey, you're, not, you're not Moses. You've never done miracles before. You've never, you don't know how to part the, the waters. You, you need some, uh, is there any leadership classes? Is there a seminary nearby? God doesn't say, hey, take some time to grieve. Take some time to grieve because you, gotta have, you have to, walk through these treacherous waters, and Moses is not here to part the, part the waters this time. God tells Joshua, Moses is dead, and then immediately he says, rise up, take the people, go across the Jordan, go into the land that I'm giving you. Why? Because every place that you step your foot, I'm going to give to you, just as I promised to Moses. And just as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. See, the key to entering the promised land, as special as Moses was and as a unique of a relationship that Moses had, the key to entering the promised land was God. Because God is also with Joshua, he's commanded to be strong and courageous. And he and Israel will inherit the land God promised. If we read this passage in a vacuum, we might think Joshua is afraid of the battle, right? But the author of Joshua assumes that we've read the first five books of the Bible because Joshua picks up exactly where Deuteronomy leaves off. So it's assuming that we've read the, read the first five books of the Bible. And what do we read there? That Joshua was afraid? He was one of two people. Only, only Joshua and Caleb were the only two that said, let's go in. Yeah, the people are bigger. They're... they're Cities are fortified. We're outnumbered, but it doesn't matter. God is with us. Let's go. We're, we're going to win. He's going to give us the land. Joshua was not afraid of the battle. The issue is not fear of battle. It's what happens when God's presence is not with them like it was with Moses. That's the issue. That's the issue. And God's encouragement here is that, yeah, Joshua, you may not be Moses, but I'm with you. I'm with you the exact same way. Joshua, yeah, your resume, it's not like Moses's. You don't have Moses' resume, not yet. 
but I'm with you. I'm fully with you. And because I'm fully with you, you can lead Israel into the promised land and receive the inheritance. These words, to be strong and courageous, are used in the same context with another important transfer of leadership between King David and his son Solomon. Who is King David? Israel's greatest king. He was someone that God describes by God's words, a man after his own heart. And now Solomon has to succeed David. Uh, No pressure. No pressure. Israel's greatest king, Solomon was not even, he was not even primed to be a great king. He was inexperienced and young. Right? Just on that basis alone was not even fit to stand in David's shoes. On that basis alone. And then after that, he, David is a man after God's own heart. Wow. It's like trying to follow Dave Chappelle at a comedy show. That's just madness. You think Solomon felt pressure? He had to succeed that, and he was charged with building God's temple. David had too much blood on his hands. That God said, no, you can't build my temple. It's got to be Solomon. And these are the exact same words that David says to Solomon, who has to follow in his footsteps. He says, be strong and courageous, build a temple. Now, it's not because he, there's fear of building a temple. Once again, the issue is, Is God going to be with me? Is his presence going to be with me like he was with my father? It's a man after God's own heart. Joshua wasn't Moses, but God prepared Joshua to lead Israel into the promised land by affirming that he was fully with him the way he was with Moses. Some of us, uh, I'm sure, I don't think this is just an Asian thing. This is probably across the board, what many of us have experienced, like we grew up in households where we were told by our parents everything that we're not. Uh, I'm sure it was done in love. I'm sure it was done in love that they were telling us what we're not to motivate us to be more successful or to do better, right? How many of us, we were compared to child prodigy violin players or piano players? I wish Asian parents were like, compared us to like electric guitarists and like drummers. But no, it's also always the, the violin player and the piano player, right? How many of us were compared to the, the A-plus student that, from the other family, right? I remember uh, recently my cousin just told me that the high school he went to, um, which is predominantly Asian, he said there's actually a ceremony for every Asian student. And this is like crazy to me. But there's a ceremony at his school at the end of the year for every Asian student that averaged 99% or more. And I'm like, what? There's more than one? Our whole economy is based on believing, making us believe that you're inadequate or what you have is inadequate. This is sociology of economics 101. I learned this in first year uh, sociology of economics class. If they don't make us, if they don't advertise to us this way, you know what happens? The economy goes into full recession. That's what they found in their studies. So they have to advertise and make you believe you're inadequate. What you have is inadequate. You always need more. You always have to buy. Or the economy shuts down. Seems to be shutting down anyway, though, these days. Social media is so much about what? You're curating your best life. You're you're putting your best foot forward. You're putting your best side forward. Forget the 20 shots that all messed up, that you messed up on. You put in that one perfect shot of you at the beach, right? It's having content that people approve of and want to see. And more than ever, we're living in a world where it feels like what we are not, what we don't have is under a microscope. And we're feeling that pressure. That same pressure of like, I don't, I don't match up to the people out there. There is a Moses out there that I don't match up to. And do you think it's this stuff is just staying out there. It's coming in here. It's coming into our face. We look online and we see great ministry happening in other churches. And then compared to ours, I'm like, oh man, nothing, nothing's happening here. 
We see other married couples becoming more godly, united, and loving, at least on the outside. And we look at our marriages and we're like, oh man, it's so dysfunctional. Our work situation is so unstable and our workplace is so toxic while we see other people, their, their situation seems to be so stable and they, they seem to be so content in their, work, in their workplace. Some of us, we're going through so much trouble and life is so hard. It's so hard. And we're seeing other people and it seems like life is just lining up perfectly for them. One of our, the, one of our friends that we visited, um, you know, the kids are, they're, our friend's kids are always saying, like, oh, my mom just prays for stuff and everything. She gets everything. She gets everything she wants, right? It seems like some people, like, life just lines up. Everything just lines up for them perfectly. It's so easy. It's not that easy. There's other stuff going on, but. And we compare ourselves and we think, man, God is with them. He's not with me. And the encouragement that God gives us today is don't focus on what you don't have. Don't focus on who you're not. You focus on me. You focus on the fact that my full presence, don't believe in the lie that I'm not with you. My full presence is with you. Joshua was not Moses. When God, when God spoke these words in our passage to Moses, I mean, so to, to Joshua, Joshua was not Moses. But as Joshua made God his focus, as he looked to God's presence in his life, what happened six chapters later? His, his resume is almost identical to Moses. Go ahead and read how similar the work that God does through Joshua is so similar to the work that he did through Moses. But don't focus on what you don't have, what's not happening, who you're not. You know, I've experienced this from both sides of the pulpit. I've experienced this as a congregant, and I've experienced this as a pastor. As a pastor, I remember there was one time in my ministry, um, I was feeling like if I just had some more mature believers, we were in a, we were in a church context where like, um, me and Mindy were kind of the people that everyone was looking to for spiritual leadership. There weren't many mature Christians to look to. And I just felt like, man, if I just had some more mature believers in my congregation, if I just had some more mature believers in my leadership, then I would experience God's inheritance in my life. That's my problem. That's my Moses. That's why I'm not experiencing the promised land. That's why I'm in the wilderness I'm just going in circles. It feels like I'm just going in circles in the wilderness. And then I took a sabbatical from ministry and realized it was never about the problem. Like, don't get me wrong. The struggle was real. The struggle was real. But the real issue was not that I didn't have enough mature leaders in my church. The real issue was I lost focus on God. That's what I realized. Because you know what happened? In my sabbatical, I went to a church where there were a lot of mature leaders and who were so generous and so kind to me and who just want to bless me. And I realized my life is still in a wilderness. I'm still going in circles in a wilderness. Yeah, the pro- like I'm never, I'm not making light of anyone's problems. I know how much people are going through in this church. But if you focus on that, it won't go well. God says, focus on me. Don't lose your focus on me this year. Focus on the fact that my full presence is with you. Focus on that. And if we are going to experience God's inheritance this year, that's what we need. We need to make sure that God is our focus. If you want to stop going in circles in the wilderness, in the wilderness that you're in, make God, your focus this year. Remember that when Peter, when he got on the sea and was walking on the water, when he focused on the storm and the waves over his head, what happened? He began sinking and drowning. But when Peter was focused on Jesus, who was walking on top of the waves, 
he was walking on water too. Don't make the problems your focus. Don't make who you're not the problem, I mean, who you're not the focus. Don't make what you don't have your focus this year. That's a recipe to sink and drown. Make God your focus. The second way God makes Joshua ready to enter the promised land is by commanding him three times to be strong and courageous. When God commands Joshua, and later he'll give the same command through Joshua to Israel to be strong and courageous, it's not, this is not like psyching yourself up, okay, let me, let, me, let me get some courage here, let me get brave, I have to run into that burning building and save these people. It's, this is not what it is. It's not what it is. It's not finding strength and courage in, in fighting skills and military tactics and finding strength and courage in their threshold and determination to win. In verses 7 and 8, God defines very clearly what he means by what their source of strength and courage is to be. It's being careful to do all that is in the law of Moses. The book of the law, the first five books of the Bible, the extent of God's word at the time, that's the Bible that they had at the time, was not to depart from Joshua's mouth. Like, isn't that, that's like awesome to me. I want that. I want, I, want, I want to know God's word, and I want God's word to be so absorbed into me that when something happens, the first words out of my mouth are something biblical. Some, there's some truth of God that's coming out of my mouth than a cuss word, right? I don't cuss, by the way, but I'm just using that as an example. He was to meditate on God's word night and day for the end goal of obeying everything. That's what would make Joshua's ways prosperous and give him success and fulfill God's purposes of going into the promised land and receiving the promised land from God, receiving that good life with God, receiving God's sufficiency in his life, becoming a light to the nations about the greatness and goodness of God. And if we're going to be made ready to experience God's inheritance this year, that's what we also need. To carefully absorb God's word for the end goal of obedience. When we read ahead in the book of Joshua, uh, we know Israel wouldn't have been able to win the battles and receive the promised land without obedience. This year, friends, if you want to stop walking in circles in the wilderness, you may want to begin reading God's word. And every day you read God's word, pick out one thing that you're going to obey. See, when you read God's word informationally, it's just information and you get nothing out of it. If, if you're just trying to speed read through the Bible and you're just reading the word, like you're not going to get anything out of it. But if you want to read for relationship, there's two things you can do. Number one, when you read God's word, pick out one thing that you're going to worship God with. Number two, pick out one thing that you're going to obey. That's relational. That's about relationship. Reading God's word just for theology, even though, believe me, I'm a theology student. I've graduated with a theology degree. I know the value of theology. But when you read only for theology, that will never be sufficient. That's not what God wants. That's not what God wants. As important as theology is, that's not enough. God says you have to know God's word. You have to know your theology to the point of obedience. There's a world of difference, as I've been saying, there's a world of difference between just reading God's word for theology and information and reading God's word for obedience. You know, when I was in seminary, I met a man in his 50s who was a dentist who began to show up to some of my classes. And he was, uh, he was set in terms of his career. He was set in terms of his finances. He was super bright, a sharp thinker. He was even uh, musically gifted. Most of the students in the seminary, they're in their 20s. There was maybe like the odd student that you would meet in their 40s who, were, who was going into, who were called into ministry late in their life. It was rare that you would see someone 50 or above. 
This man had, uh, this classmate of mine had no intention of going into the ministry. I'm like dumbfounded. I'm like, why is he here? What are you doing here? And so one day I was, I was sorry, I'm a very curious person. I'm like, I, I have to find out why this guy is here. So I, one day I asked him, uh, why, are you, why are you in seminary? Like, why are you taking all these classes? I'm like, you're, you're, I noticed that you're in quite a few of my theology classes. And his answer completely blew me away. He said, I came to seminary to learn how to be a better father. Obedience. That blew me away. You know, my experience in seminary, it did train me for ministry. I had a really good seminary experience. Um, I did wrestle with God. Seminary did give me a theological foundation to do ministry from. But truthfully, a lot of the knowledge base did not lead to intentional obedience. And that's the one regret that I have about my seminary experience, even though so much of it was good. I wish more of what, more of my focus while I was in seminary was the things that I'm learning. Not, not only am I processing do I agree or disagree, but I, I wish I spent most of, more of my focus saying, asking myself, what I'm learning in class, how am I going to obey? How am I going to live in relationship with God in obedience? Between someone who can write a theological, theologically rich book on fatherhood but didn't care anything about being a father. And by the way, I did read a book like that. Book was theologically rich, but in real life, there was other stuff happening in, in that person's life, in that author's life. And the person, like my classmate, who was going to the, he was going to the, the place where he knew he could learn most deeply about God to become a better father, to obey God's calling to be a father. Now, who, well, out of those two, I don't, even, I don't even think I have to ask, really ask this question, but I'll ask it. Out of those two people, who do you think is, in, who do you think is inheriting promised land? Who do you think will be experiencing God's inheritance? I think it's, this is a ridiculous question. Of course, we know it's the person who obeys, who's seeking to obey, not just, not just to learn, have a broad knowledge base about God, but someone who is wanting to know about God deeply for the sake of obedience. If we read the book of Joshua, like, where would they be without obedience? Could you imagine them coming before Jericho and saying, God, you want us to do what? You want us to lay down our weapons and just march around? Are you nuts? We're going to start scaling the wall. We're going to fight. And they start scaling the wall. What would have happened? They disobeyed. They would have got slaughtered. They had no chance. It's obedience. It's in obedience they were given the land. They didn't even have to shoot one arrow. God gave him the promised land. God gave him the inheritance. And today, if we are going to experience God's inheritance in 2023, that's what we need to. We need God's presence. But if we have God's presence and we're going to be in his word for the sake of obedience, we're going to inherit the promised land. Now, I know some of us are thinking this morning, uh, Pastor Ken, uh, yeah, um, I'm not, I'm, I'm struggling to just even read my Bible this year. I don't know about meditating on it. I don't know about the word not departing from my mouth. I don't know about obedience. I'm having trouble just reading God's word. The New Testament tells us our inheritance is in Jesus. He had perfect obedience. And through Jesus, the Bible also tells us we were given his spirit, his presence as a guarantee of our inheritance. 
We ask Jesus, where you are lacking today, you ask Jesus. We're going to have communion in a second. That, that, this is what it's about. This is what it's about. Where you're lacking, where you can't, we come to Jesus and we say, help us. We know the power is in Jesus, what I'm lacking. But there's another side of it as well. Joshua had to go to God's word. God was not going to do that for him. Joshua had to meditate on God's word. Joshua had to make sure that the word of God was on his lips. Joshua still needed to get up, get the people together, cross the Jordan River, and go to the other side, to the land that God was going to give him. There were still things that Joshua had to do. There were still things that God was giving him responsibility to do. So even as there are areas where maybe some of us, it's like, I just can't obey. I can't obey. We ask Jesus for help. Maybe some of us were like, I don't don't want to meditate on God's word. I'm, I'm fully satisfied with just reading the verse of the day. We ask Jesus for help. Some of us, like I said, we're having trouble just getting to God's word. We ask Jesus for help. We ask Jesus to give us the power that we don't have. But if you can get to the Bible today, let's not focus, uh, once again, let's not focus on what you can't do. Too many times we're focusing on on everything that we, we can't do. We're focusing on everything that we're not. Let's focus on what we can do. If you can go to the Bible today, let's go to the Bible today. If all you can give to God today is five minutes or daily, all you can give to God is five minutes, then start with five minutes and give God five minutes. And give it fully to, fully to God. And let him grow that. And today, what you can obey, obey. If there's nothing stopping you from obeying certain things, then obey. And the other things that you ha- are having trouble obeying today, say, Jesus, I surrender, I submit. I want to obey, but I can't. Help me. I know the power is in you. And we come to the communion table and we ask for Jesus' presence. Let's take our communion together.